I know some people that are scheduling work on Labor Day. <laughs> How'd that happen? I did it before I realized it was Labor Day. Now it's hard to go back on your word, you know. Charity, great to see you today. God bless you. <laughs> Cynthia, good to see you. God bless you. Zeus Perez was walking through the room while I was teaching Josh and Udi a Bible study. He slipped through, but he's very aware of Pentecost and used to, as far as I remember, he went to that little little white church that we used to baptize people in, uh, in Elgin. So uh, they, allowed, they opened up their church to us. I think that's where Courtney got baptized, in that little, that little church. So my daughter got baptized in the church that that, what was the pastor's name there? Do you remember? I can't, I still can't remember that, but very nice, very nice people, apostolic Spanish speaking people. They, they brought us in and they took good care of us. And that's what apostolics are like. We are excited about all that's going on. And Carlos, so happy for you. What a powerful move of the Spirit on Wednesday night. <clears throat> Someone got the Holy Ghost on Saturday during prayer meeting. Someone got the Holy Ghost Sunday during preaching meeting, and someone got baptized on Wednesday night. So I'm just trying to figure out what's about to happen today. I don't know. Uh, Holy Ghost, baptism, miracles. Just let it happen. Would you mind standing with me just for a moment? I almost feel like when I was a teenager, they, we'd have to stand up and sit down 14 times during service and Sorry for making you do that. I just ask you to do that in honor of the Word of God. We have precedent in the Word where they stood as Solomon read the Word of God. And great honor was given to the Word and great response from God was united with their, with their honor of His Word. Luke chapter 17, verse 12. Luke chapter 17, I honor all of you grandparents that came today to to potentially win the grand prize. So glad you're here. I pray that God blesses you, that God touches you, that God answers some of your prayers today. Luke chapter 17 and verse 12. And as he entered into a certain village, there met him ten men that were lepers, which stood afar off. And they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, Go show yourselves unto the priests. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed, but where are the nine? There are not found that return to give glory to God, save or except this stranger. And he said unto him, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. This man, this Samaritan, it's amazing how Jesus identified him. I mean, he singled him out and he said he was a Samaritan. There was a reason. This Samaritan, after receiving healing from leprosy, turned around when he noticed that it was that he was healed. In other words, the ulcer stopped, etc. He he was not made whole yet, but he turned around. It says, with a loud voice. With a loud voice, he glorified God, and he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he's, he was a Samaritan. This man, who was not a Jew, turned around with a loud voice, lifted up his voice, and glorified God, bowing at the feet of Jesus. And he was worshiping Jesus. And when, when we look at what happened, the Bible says that Jesus looked at him and he said, Arise, go thy way, thy faith hath made thee whole. Jesus identified worship with faith. He said, your act of worship 
is a sign of faith to me, and now I'm going to give you a miracle. Do you see that? Miracles are not, do we deserve it? Miracles are not, you know, God picks and chooses who he wants to minister to. It is those that worship him. When we begin to worship him, the, the Chinese, uh, their translation says they, they built God a big chair. They built God a big chair. What it means is they put him on a throne. They put him on a throne and they said, we, we're going to build a big chair with our worship so that you can sit upon that throne. And when we put him on a throne, there's no telling what God will do. I'm telling you, miracles, eyes can be open today. So with that, I want to preach on, on worship. Gave them my title. So worship equals faith in the eyes of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Jesus, would you help us to find a place in our hearts, Lord, where we can worship you, where we can give you God, the benevolence, do your name. We want to honor you and God and approach you, Lord, in great sacredness, Lord, as we honor your name, we honor your power, we honor your position. Jesus, you are God and and you are the only God, and we thank you for revealing that to us. We pray that you would bless the word to us in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. God bless you. You may be seated. More than praise. Leprosy was a fatal disease that literally terrified people of ancient times. It was almost like the cancer of today. You hear the big C word, and <gasps> And everybody's, oh, no. It appeared in various forms and stages of infection. People would get infection and the leprosy would set in. But once it became malignant, it was a terminal and debilitating, debilitating condition. At this stage, the skin turned white and it became numb. Then began to erupt in nodules and ulcers on the skin. The limbs would swell and the hands and feet became distorted. The bones and internal organs would be affected as the disease spread and eventually gangrene would set in which ultimately led to death. Aren't you encouraged today? Leprosy was called Sarah'at by the Jews and it meant a smiting or a scourge. There was no way to deal with infectious leprosy in ancient times other than to separate the sufferers from the general population like Moses had to do with his sister. He had to visit her outside the camp. One thing I do know is that leprosy in the Bible is always regarded as a type of sin. How do you know that? In Leviticus 14, it says, This shall be the law of the leper, in the day of his cleansing, when a leper gets cleansed, he shall be brought unto the priest. You notice it doesn't say doctor. It says he needs to be brought to the priest because it was, it was identified as a spiritual problem. Leprosy's symptoms showed on the outside, but it was primarily an internal disease of the nerve endings. They could not feel their nerve endings, their nose, their ears, etc., as that disease progressed, more and more damage was done to the body by the sufferer themselves as their sense of pain became deadened. Identifying the fact that leprosy was an illustration or a type and foreshadow of sin, we look at it, the fact that it showed on the outside. Sin has a tendency to show on the outside with addictions, with bondage, with destroying our body. But it was primarily an internal disease. You see, sin is not, is not, sin is not addiction, but addiction is sin. sin is, addiction is merely a symptom. It is an outward sign of the fact that there's something wrong inside. Our body is craving something that it shouldn't. And as the disease of sin progresses, more and more damage is done to the body by the sufferer themselves. It's amazing how someone who is bound by sin, they begin to destroy their own life. They destroy their job. They destroy their family. They destroy their finances. 
They destroy their health and ultimately destroy their life. It is like leprosy. It comes in and it begins to destroy the body. And because they can no longer feel, they end up hurting themselves and they don't know it. And, and, and they, they have problems with the body, ulcers and stuff, and they don't know what to do. And they overcompensate and, and they break they break bones and they, they do things and they can't even feel it. And that's what happens with sin because sin gets into our body on the inside. And, and ultimately, we, we get numb to the things of this world. Pretty soon, things of this world don't seem as painful as it used to be. The things that used to cause us to say, ooh, that, was, that brought conviction and guilt in my heart. It no longer does because sin has, began, has begun to numb the senses and we begin to destroy ourselves a little bit at a time. It appears that the law of Moses regarding cleansing of leprous individuals found in Leviticus chapter 13 and 14 had never been used before in Jewish history. Now I know you say, well, what about Naaman? Naaman was healed of leprosy in the Old Testament. Naaman was not a Jew. But suddenly, New Testament, nine lepers... One straggling makes it 10, come to the priest asking for cleansing. And they look at each other, I forgot what we're supposed to do. This has never happened. I, I learned this in university. I learned it in, in Jewish priest university, but I never had to apply it. When you don't apply something, you have a tendency to forget it. And all of a sudden, 10 people show up in one day. And they say, we've been cleansed of leprosy, so they have to dust off the ancient books and figure out what ceremony they have to go through. Why did this happen? Because when Jesus shows up on the scene, things that you've never seen before will begin to happen. Things you've never heard about before will begin to happen. You're going to have to dust off the old book and look at it and say, did that really happen? People get baptized in Jesus' name. People get filled with the Holy Ghost. People begin to speak in tongues. And, and, and I've had people say, oh, that's some new thing. I said, oh, no. It's older than anything else in this world. It's the oldest religion known to man. It's the first thing that was taught on the day of Pentecost as they began to receive the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues and being baptized in Jesus' name. It's older. So all ten lepers receive a miraculous healing but only one returns to Jesus to thank him and the Bible makes a point like I'd mentioned to tell us that he was a Samaritan and a stranger nine were Jews those nine Jews knew a lot more than that Samaritan did regarding the Messiah regarding the fact that there would be healing in his wings regarding all of them all of the prophecies regarding the Messiah the fact that the blind eyes would be opened, the, the deaf would hear, the lame would walk, the poor would have the gospel preached, and all of this prophecy that came, and, and the Jews knew when it happened, and yet when they received a miracle, they turned and ran to show themselves to the priest and never thanked him, never worshipped him. They knew more, but they did less. It should have been those Jewish lepers that worshiped the Lord, not that Samaritan. How do I know they were Jewish? Because Jesus said, go show yourself to the priest. But one was a Samaritan. So the others had to have been Jews. He said, it's the time of ceremonial cleansing. You have to go show yourself. Where are the nine? The Jews were so blessed. They were privileged to be different than other people in their lifestyle. Distinguished by peculiar laws, things that seem strange to others, their statutes, their observances, their diet, their conversation. God gave them a tabernacle where they could offer sacrifices unto God and celebrate specific feasts given to the Jews, the festivals, and where God's own Shekinah glory would dwell among them. God led them through the wilderness to the promised land, giving them manna, giving them water, giving them quail, casting out all their enemies before them and miraculously providing for them. A Jewish person healed of leprosy should have been an out-of-control worshiper. Already God blessing them with everything that he had given them, and they receive a miracle, and they turn and they run. And they, it was almost like they were entitled. Does that sound familiar? We can receive things from God and yet forget Pentecostals have also been abundantly blessed. 
We've been chosen from every tongue, nation, and people to worship the one true God whose name is Jesus. We're privileged to be different than other people in our lifestyle, and we don't mind in the least being distinguished by God's laws. It doesn't, doesn't harm me in one way or another. It, do, it matters nothing to me what the world thinks. I feel privileged to know the word of God and to say, if this is what you want, then I am honored that you would allow me to understand and walk with you and talk with you. God has given us a wonderful place to worship where his spirit, his presence dwells among us. And we're glad. We are glad. I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I get excited when somebody says, let's go to church. And, and I just am amazed and say, what, is you, what are you going to do today, Jesus? You're just an awesome God. Not that you only do miracles in the building of God. God brought each of us out of sin. He's given us abundant life and the power to conquer sin. What an amazing power. The greatest miracle in my mind is not that somebody walks that has never walked, that somebody that has cancer has tumors fall off, although all these have happened, that the dead have been raised. That's not the biggest miracle in my, in my thinking. My biggest miracle is when somebody is so bound by sin and Jesus touches their life in one service, turns them around, washes their sins away in his blood, in the baptismal, in Jesus' name, and fills them with his spirit, giving them the power to live above sin, and their life is completely changed. That is the biggest miracle I have ever and ever will see. Somebody who was walking in darkness and is now walking in light. We have a lot to praise God for. And every Pentecostal who's been delivered from the leprosy of sin should be a fanatical worshiper. Let us never forget to give thanks to the one who has delivered us, to open our heart to the one who has filled us with his power and his presence, one that has opened the doors of salvation for us and has blessed us every step that we take. If anyone's going to praise God, it ought to be us. We are one of those nine. We're no longer strangers. We're not Samaritans. We're Jews according to Romans 8. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Notice he uses the Hebrew, Abba, Father. That's the, he's saying you have been adopted as a Jew. You are adopted Jews. You are adopted. Jesus said, I came to my own, and they received me not. So I went out to the Gentiles to bring them into the Jewish family to worship like a Jew. Have you ever seen a Jew worship? They don't just stand there. They rock back and forth. They go like this. They jump. They spin. They worship him. I don't want to be a Samaritan. I want to be a spiritual Jew and worship. <laughs> Hallelujah. How is it that people who know God less can praise him more? We have a unique ability that the other millions of creatures on this earth don't have. We have the ability to open our mouth and speak the praises of God. The Bible says the the waves clap their hands. It says the trees wave their arms and sing. But they don't have a voice. But we humans have a voice. We can lift up our voice and we can say, Holy, holy, holy art thou, Lord God Almighty. He who was and is and is to come, the almighty God. You are the Savior. You are the Comforter. You are my guide. You are my healer. You are the sovereign King. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. You are the only true God. Something gets a hold of somebody when they know who they're talking to. You are. You are. You are. Luke chapter 19, 39 says, And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke your disciples. They were getting a little exuberant. And Jesus said, I tell you that if these should hold their peace, 
the stones would immediately cry out because I was made to receive worship. And if you don't do it, I'll find it. I'll get it from something. But why don't we take our place today, move the stones aside, and say, Lord, I worship you. The Bible is filled with praise. We don't apologize for our exuberance in worshiping God. I asked somebody recently, so how did you enjoy the service? And they said it was a little loud. And, and they said, and it was interesting. I said, that's fair. But it wasn't interesting to me. And it wasn't loud to me. It was wow to me. It was, these people know something I don't know. I want to know what they know because I see people that are jumping and shouting. The only people I saw were on drugs or drunk that were jumping and shouting, and they didn't feel good in the morning. But these people don't get a hangover. These people don't get addicted to something that takes over their life. They give themselves to it. Something's different about these people. Hallelujah. With so many commandments in the Bible to praise God, how could anyone think they're obeying the Bible without worshiping exuberantly? You got to tear out half the Bible to say, I want to pray quietly and to myself. First of all, we don't pray to ourselves. Because there's only one God. I don't pray to myself. I can't help myself. I pray to the one who can. I pray to the one that can stop a storm. I pray to the one that can open up his mouth and create a universe. I pray to a one that can speak to the dead and pull him out of a grave. That's the God I speak to. Psalms 134, and I apologize upstairs for going so quickly. Lift up your hands in the sanctuary and bless the Lord. 149.6, let the high praises of God be in your mouth and a two-edged sword in your hand. 118.1, oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good because his mercy endureth forever. 122.1, I was glad when they said, Unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. 118, 24. This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. 47, 1. Oh, clap your hands, all ye people, and shout. Shout. Oh, shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Oh, clap and shout, for he is worthy, and his mercy endureth unto all generations. And just in case you think I missed you for some reason, Psalms 150, verse 6, the last verse of Psalms says, Let everything... Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. He didn't say everything that has a thought. He said, if you have a breath, use it to praise him. Use it to lift up his name because he's worthy. Everything. Hallelujah. Do you remember what I said? If you begin to worship, it's time to look for a miracle. If you don't have a miracle, it's time to worship. Begin to worship. Begin to lift him up and then expect the miraculous to happen. For every obstacle you help me overcome, I praise you. For every time I felt your presence, I praise you. For every time you healed my body, I praise you. For every victory you've given me, I praise you. For every trial you brought me through, I praise you. For every blessing you've given me, I give you praise. Hallelujah. <sighs> Hallelujah. All ten lepers were cleansed, but only one of them was made whole. The one who returned to worship him because worship opens the door to the miraculous. Many people here today have been cleansed from sin but still struggling. They were healed of leprosy yet still struggled. 
still drug their feet with no toes on them, their hands with no fingers. They were healed of leprosy, but still had the struggle of the disease. Why? Because they don't realize that worship, worship brings the miraculous. What does worship do for the child of God? One of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God. First of all, he turned back. He turned back. Sounds like repentance. God, I'm going to turn away and turn towards you. He turned back and then with a loud voice, he didn't just think it. He said it. I give you glory. I give you praise. I don't deserve it. Your Jewish people don't deserve it, but specifically me. I, I don't worship the God of the Jews, but I am now because you healed me, and I thank you for it. I'm praising you for it, and I'm worshiping you. When he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him praise. See, when God creates trees and cows, he created them in the environment that they could survive. That's why a tree cannot exist when it's separated from the soil. When God created fish, he created them in the water. That's why fish cannot exist apart from the water. They only survive if they're kept in the environment in which they were created. When God created man, he created man in the garden in God's presence. And that's why man can never exist apart from the presence of God. That's why when he said, you're going to get out of the garden. That's when he said, in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. Why? Because you're removed from the presence of God. The only way that we can live forever is to somehow find our way into the presence of God and stay there. The only way we can do it is to create praise and worship in the house of God in our lives. When we begin to worship him, his glory comes. When his glory comes, life will come. When life comes, we will begin to speak Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgiveth all thine iniquities, who healeth all thy diseases, who redeemeth. Notice this came after. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name, who forgiveth iniquities healeth diseases who redeemeth thy life from destruction who crowneth thee with loving kindness and tender mercies who satisfieth thy mouth with good things so that thy youth is renewed like the eagles when david said bless the lord He's not just saying that we bless the Lord because of past benefits. He's also telling us that as we bless the Lord, we continue to walk in the benefits of praise. How do I know? He that forgiveth. That means to continue to forgive. As we bless his holy name, as we worship him, he will continue to forgive. He will continue to heal. He will continue to redeem. He will continue to crown your head with righteousness. He will continue to satisfy your soul. I will bless the Lord, 34. I will bless the Lord at all times. All times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul shall make her boast in the Lord you want to boast about something boast about him the humble shall hear and be glad oh magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together exalt means to lift up for I sought the Lord and he heard me and delivered me from all my fears how do we possibly magnify a God who is already everywhere? Magnify, looked it up this morning, to be large. Isn't God everywhere? To advance, to boast, to bring up, to exceed, excellent, become, greater, grow, increase, lift up magnify. That's what it means. How do you magnify God? Praise and worship doesn't change God's ability or God's power. It merely changes your perspective on God. You begin to worship him. Pretty soon God sits in a big chair. Pretty soon God has big muscles. Pretty soon God envelops this universe. Pretty soon God cares. Pretty soon God has magical, miraculous powers. Pretty soon God knows your name. 
That all happens when we begin to worship. God becomes bigger, not physically, not spiritually, but in our mind. We start to believe him more when God becomes bigger. I remember when kids picked on me, I was just the littlest kid. I was 16 years old. I was five foot tall and 100 pounds. That's what my first driver's license said. And I didn't lie. Some people weigh 600 and they put down 200. You know, you know what I'm saying? I didn't lie. I was 100 pounds. A good stiff wind caused me trouble. When these people were picking on me at school, I just turned and looked at the corner of my eye and I saw my brother Dan there. I was fine because he was big. He could take six guys on at one time. As long as he was standing there, I was okay. But if I was there alone, see, when you begin to worship God, when you get in a, in a pinch, you begin to have fear. You begin to have doubt. But all of a sudden, you begin to worship God, and his presence shows up. And you say, I oh, don't worry anymore because my great big brother is here. He can handle all you guys at the same time. He can handle cancer. He can handle bad marriages. He can handle disease. He can handle sin. He can handle addiction. He can handle deliverance. <clears throat> First Chronicles 21. I'm just going to tell you the story so I can finish. Satan, the Bible says Satan provoked David to number Israel. That was a sign of doubt on the king's part. <laughs> Or a sign of pride, both of them bring destruction. God smote Israel for David's actions. And Gad, who was David's seer, David's prophet, he brought David three choices from the Lord. He's like, I'm in trouble. And Gad comes and he says, well, God gave you three choices. We're going to let you choose. You can either have three years of famine in the land. You can have three months of losing to your enemies in battle. And so it doesn't sound very good so far. Or you can have three days that the sword of the Lord with pestilence will come through your land. And David submitted to the mercies of God. He said, you know what? I don't even feel worthy to choose. Let me fall into the hands of a just and worthy God. Pestilence came for three days, went through the land. He submitted to the mercies of God and 70,000 people died. 70,000 people died of pestilence. The Lord instructed David to set up an altar at the threshing floor of Ornan. And when he showed up to Ornan's place, Ornan's threshing floor, Ornan saw it was King David, and he bowed in honor to him, and he said, he said, King, what are you here for? And he said, well, I need to offer a sacrifice. I need to offer a sacrifice because I need this pestilence to stop. And he said, this is what the Lord's angel told me to do. And this is what I'm going to do. And Ornan said, oh, my goodness. He said, let me, let me be a part of this. He said, I'm going to tell you what. You can have the land. You can have, here's the altar. Here, I'll even donate all the sacrifices, all my stuff. And David said something there that is so important to us. He said, I will not give unto the Lord that which cost me nothing. I'm not going to take your sacrifice, Pastor Goff. You give me sacrifice, and then I turn around and I give it unto the Lord and say, there, stop the pestilence in my life. David said, oh, no, 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 no. This has got to cost me something. Because true worship is more valuable than praise. It's more than praise because <laughs> praise doesn't cost you anything. Praise is the result of us receiving something or watching God do something. God scores a goal. That's what praise is. Good job. Good job, God. God gives us something. Thank you. It's, it's merely saying, good job, God. Praise is easy because praise comes as a result of us already receiving something or something that has already been done. It's all, it doesn't take faith to believe God when it's already in your hand. It doesn't take faith to believe God when it's already done. We just say, good job. Good job, God. 
Great miracle. Great universe you made for us. Thank you, God. Great job. Great church. Thank you, God. I didn't do anything to receive this. Great job, God. But Abraham, Abraham, a very wealthy man because he served God, had servants enough to put together an army. And God says, look at all I've done for you, Abraham. And Abraham says, good job, God. And then God said, now I want you to take your son, your only son Isaac, and give him to me. not quite so excited about that. I like it when you give me stuff. I like it when you perform for me. But now you're asking me for something. Hmm. But the hour cometh, and now is when true worshipers, John 4, true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father seeketh such to worship him. True Worshippers. That means there are false worshipers. If Jesus said there are true worshipers, that means there are people that are worshiping that aren't true. God, if there are false worshipers, help me not to be one of those. Because it says the Father is looking for such to worship. God is looking for true worshipers. We confuse the word worship with thanksgiving and praise, and it teaches all this praise. Make a joyful noise. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. It doesn't say enter the holy of holies with thanksgiving. It says enter his gates with thanksgiving into his courts with praise. You're still on the outside. You haven't gotten close to him at all. Thanksgiving and praise merely gets you in the court. But you're not in the holy place, neither are you in the holy of holies. Because you have not become yet a true worshiper. You are merely thanking him, oh God. You're thanking him for what he's done, but not for who he is. Isaiah 51, for the Lord shall comfort Zion. He will comfort all her waste places. And he will make her wilderness like Eden and her desert like the garden of the Lord. Think all the things God will do. Joy and gladness shall be found therein. No kidding. You take a desert and make it a garden of Eden? Good job, God. The term thanksgiving simply means to render thanks to God for blessings already granted. Thanksgiving is an easy thing for us because, like I said, the act of thanksgiving always hinges on the fact that God has already done something for us. And then there's the term praise. Praise ye the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. Praise him for his mighty acts. Psalms 151. Praise him for his mighty acts. What you've done. Good job. Good job, God. Testimonies of healing and salvation and deliverance and provision make us desire to give thanks to God and to praise Him for what He has done in our midst. And there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, the Bible commands us to give praise in the sanctuary. Praise Him for what He has done. Be thankful for what God has done. In times of Scripture, David said, Praise ye the Lord. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. I love to praise Him. I love to thank him for all the things he's done. I love to stomp my feet and jump up and down and dance before the Lord. And when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. Thank you for what you've already done. But it is possible to be a thanksgiver and a praiser and yet not be a worshiper. Because worship means something entirely different. Worship means pure adoration unto God, not based on acts of blessing, but based on his nature and fact that he is God alone. Worship is contingent on who God is. It's easy to give thanks and praise, but not always easy to worship. True worship says, even though I lost my job, I'll worship you. 
Even though, my, even though my marriage is falling apart, I'll worship you. Even though my family turns against me, I'll still worship you. True worship says no matter what's happening in my life, you are God, your excellent greatness has never changed, and I will never cease to worship you because of who you are. If I don't have food on the table, I'll worship you. If I don't have money in the bank, I'll worship you. If I don't have peace in my home, I'll worship you. If I'm not being blessed, I'll worship you. I'll still stand with my hands raised and worshiping the one true God because no matter what you have done or have not done, you are God and there is no one else beside you. Yea, I know not any. God is seeking those people to worship and I'm closing. Abraham had been a praiser and a thanksgiver for a long time, but we know the story how God asked him. God said, now I'm going to see how much you really love me and not just what I can do for you. And when he did and Abraham passed the test, God said, now I know. Now I know what? That Abraham will worship me when it costs him something. In Genesis 22 it says, Abraham said unto his young men, Abide here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship. Abraham counted giving up his only son Isaac to God, giving him to God, taking the life of his only son Isaac. He called it worship. God didn't call it worship. Abraham called it worship. He said, guys, you wait here with the donkey. I'm going to take my son. We're going to go and worship, and I'll see you in a little while. We're going to go worship. See, worship is not praise. Worship is not thanks. Worship says, in spite of my loss, I'm going to glorify your name. I'm going to lift up your name because you are able Job was another man that lost everything, lost his kids, lost his, all his possessions, and he was one of the greatest men in all of that land, in all of the land of the east, and he lost it all in a day. The only thing he had left was his wife, and she said, curse God and die. It's easy to praise God when you have such great substance. It's easy to give the Lord thanks when he's given you so much. It's easy to love God as long as you're on the receiving end, but when you lose something, it's difficult to lift your hands. It's difficult to open up your voice and say hallelujah to a great and merciful God, to a God who spans the universe, to a God full of compassion and mercy and truth when we're hurting. Job arose, tore his mantle and shaved his head, fell down upon the ground and worshiped and said, naked came I out of my mother's womb and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, the Lord hath taken away. Just like we sang, blessed be the name of the Lord. He bowed down and worshiped the Lord when he lost everything. <sighs> Philistines, would you stand with me? The Philistines had stolen the ark of the covenant and brought it back after God struck them with all sorts of troubles. People were dying because the Philistines had taken the ark. And God was cursing them because they took something that didn't belong to them. And when they took it from the Israelites, there were three things in that ark. It was Aaron's rod that budded. It was the pot of manna. And it was the tables of stone. Aaron's rod that budded, I'll bring, I'll bring life from death. Salvation. Restoration. It was the pot of manna, I will provide for you. And it was the tables of stone. I'm going to give you direction. When they brought it back from the Philistine camp, the only thing left in the ark were the tables of stone. The pot of manna was gone. The rod that budded was gone. The Philistines had taken it out. They had taken the things from the ark which represented the presence of God. They took things that represented receiving from God. The only thing left was the law the tables of stone. The Philistines were saying, we want the miracle working power of God and we want the provision of God, but we don't want the law of God. We want to serve your God when he's blessing, when he's working miracles, but that's as far as it goes. But the Bible says in 2 Samuel 6, 14, that when the Ark of the Covenant came back into Jerusalem, 
It says, and David danced before the Lord with all his might. And David was girded with a linen ephod. He only wore that when he was in a state of worship. David was communicating to us today, my worship church doesn't hinge on all the times God has provided for me, the blessings he's given me and the miracles that he has done. But I have the F ephod of worship on today simply because inside this ark are contained the words of my God. And if he never does another thing for me, I'm going to worship him just because of who he is. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let's begin to do that right now. What about the prosperity doctrine? If you'll give, if you'll sell your house and give everything to God, God will make you a multi-billionaire. Forget about all that. Honor the word of God. That's all I ask you to do. You honor the word of God and trust him. And God will bless you, but that's not why we serve him. We serve him because he's the only God, because he deserves our worship. He's worth everything to me. And if the only thing he ever gives me from this point on is his word, I will worship you because you're God, because you created the heavens and the earth, because you formed me out of the dust of the ground and you gave me life. And then you called me into a church and you filled me with your presence. Lord, you've already given. What more can you do for me but bless me materialistically? God, help me to focus on my relationship with you and not just the reality of your blessings. Jesus, if all that's left in the church today is the word, will we still worship like we did before? your mind coming to tell him that? Would you come to this altar and just worship? Remember, worship opens the door to the miraculous. When we thank him and worship him, fall on our faces in worship, Jesus literally doubles the miracle. He said, because you chose to give me the glory, because you chose to come to me and worship me, and you're not even a Jew, I'm going to give you a miracle and make you whole. I'm going to give you back the things that you lost. Let's come and worship today. Oh, let's approach him with great honor and respect. Let's worship. Jesus. familiar with it, just lift your hands to him. It's a sign of blessing and praise unto him. His You're saying, I surrender to your sovereignty. I give you praise and worship. Fill the temple. Draw on yourself with your prayer, with your worship. You pull it closer as you worship him. 